Sir so René, <coughs> just the David Eagleman's video. We are built out of very small stuff and we are embedded in a very large cosmos. And the fact is that we are not very good at understanding reality at either of those scales. And that's because our brains haven't evolved to understand the world at that scale. Instead, we're trapped on this very thin slice of perception right in the middle. But it gets strange because even at that slice of reality that we call home, we're not seeing most of the action that's going on. So take the colors of our world. This is light waves, electromagnetic radiation that bounces off objects and it hits specialized receptors in the back of our eyes. But we're not seeing all the waves out there. In fact, what we see is less than a 10 trillionth of what's out there. So you have radio waves and microwaves and x-rays and gamma rays passing through your body right now and you're completely unaware of it because you don't come with the proper biological receptors for picking it up. There are thousands of cell phone conversations passing through you right now and you're utterly blind to it. Now, it's not that these things are inherently unseeable. Snakes include some infrared in their uh, reality and honeybees include ultraviolet in their view of the world. And of course, we build machines in the dashboards of our cars to pick up on signals in the radio frequency range. And we build machines in hospitals to pick up on the x-ray range. But you can't sense any of those by yourself, at least not yet, because you don't come equipped with the proper sensors. Now, what this means is that our experience of reality is constrained by our biology. And that goes against the common sense notion that our eyes and our ears and our fingertips are just picking up the objective reality that's out there. Instead, our brains are sampling just a little bit of the world. Now, across the animal kingdom, different animals pick up on different parts of reality. So in the blind and deaf world of the tick, the important signals are temperature and butyric acid. In the world of the black ghost knife fish, its sensory world is lavishly colored by electrical fields. And for the echolocating bat, its reality is constructed out of air compression waves. That's the slice of their ecosystem that they can pick up on. And we have a word for this in science. It's called the Umwelt, which is the German word for the surrounding world. Now, presumably, every animal assumes that its Umwelt is the entire objective reality out there. Because why would you ever stop to imagine that there's something beyond what we can sense? Instead, what we all do is we accept reality as it's presented to us. So let's do a consciousness razor on this. Imagine that you were a bloodhound dog. Your whole world is about smelling. You've got a long snout that has 200 million scent receptors in it and you have wet nostrils that attract and trap scent molecules, and your nostrils even have slits so you can take big nosefuls of air. Everything is about smell for you. So one day, you stop in your tracks with a revelation. You look at your human owner and you think, what is it like to have the pitiful, impoverished nose of a human? What is it like when you take a feeble little nose full of air? How can you not know that there's a cat 100 yards away? Or that your neighbor was on this very spot six hours ago? <laughs> so because we're humans, we've never experienced that world of smell, so we don't miss it. Because we are firmly settled into our umwelt. But the question is, do we have to be stuck there? So as a neuroscientist, I'm interested in the way that technology might expand our umwelt and how that's going to change the experience of being human. So we already know that we can marry our technology to our biology because there are hundreds of thousands of people walking around with artificial hearing and artificial vision. So the way this works is 
You take a microphone and you digitize a signal and you put an electrode strip directly into the inner ear. Or with the retinal implant, you take a camera and you digitize the signal and then you plug an electrode grid directly into the optic nerve. And as recently as 15 years ago, there were a lot of scientists who thought these technologies wouldn't work. Why? It's because these technologies speak the language of Silicon Valley, and it's not exactly the same dialect as our natural biological sense organs. But the fact is that it works. The brain figures out how to use the signals just fine. Now, how do we understand that? Well, here's the big secret. Your brain is not hearing or seeing any of this. Your brain is locked in a vault of silence and darkness inside your skull. All it ever sees are electrochemical signals that come in along different data cables, and this is all it has to work with, and nothing more. Now, amazingly, the brain is really good at taking in these signals and extracting patterns and assigning meaning so that it takes this inner cosmos and puts together a story of this, your subjective world. But here's the key point. Your brain doesn't know and it doesn't care where it gets the data from. Whatever information comes in, it just figures out what to do with it. And this is a very efficient kind of machine. It's essentially a general purpose computing device and it just takes in everything and figures out what it's going to do with it. And that, I think, frees up Mother Nature to tinker around with different sorts of input channels. So I call this the pH model of evolution. And I don't want to get too technical here, but pH stands for potato head. And <laughs> I use this name to emphasize that all these sensors that we know and love, like our eyes and our ears and our fingertips, these are merely peripheral plug-and-play devices. You stick them in and you're good to go. The brain figures out what to do with the data that comes in. And when you look across the animal kingdom, you find lots of peripheral devices. So snakes have heat pits with which to detect infrared, and the ghost knifefish has electroreceptors, and the star-nosed mole has this appendage with 22 fingers on it with which it feels around and constructs a 3D model of the world. And many birds have magnetites so that they can orient to the magnetic field of the planet. So what this means is that Nature doesn't have to continually redesign the brain. Instead, with the principles of brain operation established, all nature has to worry about is designing new peripherals. Okay, so what this means is this. The lesson that surfaces is that there's nothing really special or fundamental about the biology that we come to the table with. It's just what we have inherited from a complex road of evolution, but it's not what we have to stick with. And our best proof of principle of this comes from what's called sensory substitution. And that refers to feeding information into the brain via unusual sensory channels. And the brain just figures out what to do with it. Now, that might sound speculative, but the first paper demonstrating this was published in the journal Nature in 1969. So a scientist named Paul Bach E. Rita put blind people in a modified dental chair, and he set up a video feed, and he'd put something in front of the camera, and then you would feel that poked into your back with a grid of solenoids. So if you wiggle a coffee cup in front of the camera, you're feeling that in your back. And amazingly, blind people got pretty good at being able to determine what was in front of the camera just by feeling it in the small of their back. Now, there have been many modern incarnations of this. The sonic glasses take a video feed right in front of you and turn that into a sonic landscape. So as things move around and get closer and farther, it sounds like sounds like a cacophony. But after several weeks, blind people start getting pretty good at understanding what's in front of them just based on what they're hearing. 
And it doesn't have to be through the ears. This system uses a uh, electro-tactile grid on the forehead. So it's ever in front of the video feed, you're feeling it on your forehead. Why the forehead? Because you're not using it for much else. The most, the most modern incarnation is called the brain port. And this is a little electrode grid that sits on your tongue. And the video feed gets turned into these little electro-tactile signals. And blind people get so good at using this that they can throw a ball into a basket, or they can navigate complex obstacle courses. They can come to see through their tongue. Now, that sounds completely insane, right? But remember, all vision ever is, is electrochemical signals coursing around in your brain. Your brain doesn't know where the signals come from. It just figures out what to do with them. So my interest in my lab is Sensory substitution for the deaf. And this is a project I've undertaken with a graduate student in my lab, Scott Novick, who's spearheading this for his thesis. And here's what we wanted to do. We wanted to make it so that sound from the world gets converted in some way so that a deaf person can understand what is being said. And we wanted to do this, given the power and ubiquity of portable computing, we wanted to make sure that this would run on cell phones and tablets. And also, we wanted to make this a wearable, something that you could wear under your clothing. So here's the concept. So as I'm speaking, my sound is getting captured by the tablet, and then it's getting mapped onto a vest that's covered in vibratory motors, just like the motors uh, in your cell phone. So as I'm speaking, the sound is getting translated to a pattern of vibration on the vest. Now, this is not just conceptual. This tablet is transmitting Bluetooth, and I'm wearing the vest right now. So as I'm speaking, the sound is getting translated into dynamic patterns of vibration. I'm feeling the sonic world around me. So. We've been testing this with deaf people now, and it turns out that after just a little bit of time, people can start feeling, they can start understanding the language of the vest. So this is Jonathan. He's 37 years old. He has a master's degree. He was born profoundly deaf, which means that there's a part of his umwelt that's unavailable to him. So we had Jonathan train with the vest for four days, two hours a day. And here he is on the fifth day. You. So Scott says a word, Jonathan feels it on the vest, and he writes it on the board. Where? Where? Jonathan's able to translate this complicated pattern of vibrations into an understanding of what's being said. Touch. Touch. Now, he's not doing this. Jonathan's not doing this consciously because the patterns are too complicated, but his brain is starting to unlock the pattern that allows it to figure out what the data mean. And our expectation is that after wearing this for about three months, he will have a direct perceptual experience of hearing. In the same way that when a blind person passes a finger over Braille, the meaning comes directly off the page without any conscious intervention at all. Now, this technology has the potential to be a game changer because the only other solution for deafness is a cochlear implant, and that requires an invasive surgery. And this can be built for 40 times cheaper than a cochlear implant, which opens up this technology globally, even for the poorest countries. Now, we've been very encouraged by our results with sensory substitution, but what we've been thinking a lot about is sensory addition. How can we use a technology like this to add a completely new kind of sense to expand the human umwelt? For example, could we feed real-time data from the internet directly into somebody's brain, and can they develop a direct perceptual experience? So here's an experiment we're doing in the lab. A subject is feeling a real-time streaming feed from the net of data for five seconds. Then two buttons appear, 
and he has to make a choice. He doesn't know what's going on. He makes a choice and he gets feedback after one second. Now here's the thing. The subject has no idea what all the patterns mean, but we're seeing if he gets better at figuring out which button to press. He doesn't know that what we're feeding is real-time data from the stock market. And he's making buy and sell decisions. <laughs> and the feedback is telling him whether he did the right thing or not. And what we're seeing is can we expand the human umwelt so that he comes to have, after several weeks, a direct perceptual experience of the economic movements of the planet. So we'll report on that later to see how well this goes. Here's, here's another thing we're doing. During the talks this morning, we've been automatically scraping Twitter for the TED 2015 hashtag, and we've been doing an automated sentiment analysis, which means are people using positive words or negative words or neutral? And while this has been going on, I have been feeling this. And so I'm plugged in to the aggregate emotion of thousands of people in real time. And that's a new kind of human experience because now I can know how everyone's doing and how much you're loving this. <laughs> it's a bigger experience than a human can normally have. We're also expanding the umwelt of pilots. So in this case, the vest is streaming nine different measures from this quadcopter. So pitch and yaw and roll and orientation and heading. And that improves this pilot's ability to fly it. It's essentially like he's extending his skin up there, far away. And that's just the beginning. What we're envisioning is taking a modern cockpit full of gauges and instead of trying to read the whole thing, you feel it. We live in a world of information now, and there's a difference between accessing big data and experiencing it. So I think there's really no end to the possibilities on the horizon for human expansion. Just imagine an astronaut being able to feel the overall health of the International Space Station. Or for that matter, having you feel the invisible states of your own health, like your blood sugar and the state of your microbiome. Or having 360 degree vision or seeing in infrared or ultraviolet. So the key is this, as we move into the future, we're going to increasingly be able to choose our own peripheral devices. We no longer have to wait for Mother Nature's sensory gifts on her time scales. But instead, like any good parent, she's given us the tools that we need to go out and define our own trajectory. So the question now is, how do you want to go out and experience your universe? Thank you. OK, so let's try and figure this uh, thing out. Obviously, David's very smart uh, neuroscientist, right? Uh, look at the creativity behind his work. But he's still operating on what we call a physicalist model of reality. What we call a physicalist ontology. The word ontology is a philosophical term that uh, most scientists are not even familiar with these days because they're still stuck in the scientific model. So ontology means what's the nature of existence. That's the philo philosophical term ontology means the nature of existence, the nature of being. It's a very important word in philosophy. And there are two ontologies these days. One is called physical, the other is called non-physical. Okay, the, the fundamental nature of existence is physical. And the other, which is the majority of scientists, including David, you can see. Okay. Then the other ontology is <clears throat> the fundamental nature of being or existence. Um, same term, being, existence, is non-physical. And it's awareness or consciousness. And what is consciousness? <clears throat> consciousness.
Consciousness is the capacity for experience. Consciousness is that which makes experience possible. Consciousness is the knowing element in every experience. Rupert Spira, who's a non-dual teacher, I mean, he's going to be here uh, <clears throat> next month. Is seduction next month? When is seduction of spirit? October? October. Yeah, so he's going to be here. And he has a very elegant um, description of consciousness or awareness. He says consciousness is that um, in which experience occurs. Consciousness is that in which experience is known. And consciousness is that out of which experience is made. Okay, so I've given you many definitions. Consciousness makes experience possible. It's the capacity for experience. It's the knowing element in every experience. It um, is that in which experience occurs, that in which experience is known, and that out of which experience is made. Why? Because consciousness modifies itself into sensations, images, feelings, thoughts, sense perceptions. <clears throat> so, actually, there is only consciousness, and everything else is an experience. These are the two competing ontologies. Ontology. What is the fundamental nature of existence? So, the physicalist ontology says, ontological primitive of the universe is a physical entity. And the non-physical model says the fundamental primitive of the universe is a non-physical awareness. Non-physical also means doesn't have form. <clears throat> so right in the beginning we can say, just from what we know today about science, by the way, and what is science? Science is, it's not a method of telling us what the truth is. Just please know that, okay? Science is not a methodology for knowing truth. Science is a method of inquiry in human consciousness, right? It's a method of inquiry and a very precise method of inquiry, you know, which is based on theories and where are theories conceived? In consciousness. So theory, experiment. Who designs experiments? Consciousness. And observation. Where are observations made? In consciousness. So science is a method, a very precise method of inquiry in human consciousness. We are the only species who do science. Right? Those snakes and electrical eels, they don't do science, right? But they also have experience. So, when we look at the scientific model of the universe right now, I mentioned this morning to you there are four forces, electromagnetism, strong and weak interactions, gravity. These are human constructs for modes of knowing and experience. Very useful because we can do some precise measurements, we can create models, we can create technology. Look at the amazing technology, you wear a vest and then you can feel an object out there, seemingly, right? You can enter the world of snakes and uh, electrical eels and, uh, and uh, the world of um, honeybees by extending this um, experience through technology. So technology is amazing as a product of a particular method of inquiry that we call science. And it is now getting us a little close to understanding that um, reality... <laughs> What we call reality is very kind of um, ephemeral. You know, your, he said, the umwelt, the, the band of reality on a visual level is tenth of a trillionth of what's happening around you. Tenth of a trillionth. Okay, so all the stars, all the galaxies, all the planets, that's tenth of a trillionth of what's happening. 
And even your experience of your body is tenth of a trillionth of what might be behind the reality, right? So science is taking us to the edge where we can already see there's no such thing as a reality. Reality is a species-specific experience. We are a particular species. We call ourselves humans, homo sapiens, which, by the way, means the wise ones. And we gave ourselves that name. <laughs> and, you know, how um, humble of us. Uh, so we are a particular species that experiences what we can only call a human universe, right? But even our body-mind is a particular experience. Right? You have no idea what you look like to an insect with a hundred eyes or, you know, uh, to a worm or to a honeybee or to a snake or to a bat. So even your own body is an experience. Now, not David's fault, brilliant scientist, but scientists are trained in a particular model of reality. <clears throat> and their ontology is physicalist. And once you buy into a model, everything within that model makes sense. But he used interesting words. The brain figures out. Right? If the brain is a physical object, how does it figure out? If the brain is... A mechanical, he said, machine, right? You heard the word. If the brain is a machine, how does it even figure out how to convert digital data, literally digital data, into an experience, a three-dimensional experience? And he didn't go into that, but that's called the hard problem of consciousness, okay? There's an assumption, there's an assumption here that the brain is getting digital data in the form of photons, a little narrow band of electromagnetic activity, and then the brain is somehow taking that digital data and creating a three-dimensional world of experience, including the experience of your own body. That he doesn't answer, and he doesn't need to within the scientific model the, the physics model says, shut up and calculate. Okay, don't try to figure this out. If your calculations work and you can create technology, that's good enough. Okay, that's the business of science is literally not to figure out what reality is. The business of science is um, to basically be able to measure experience and um, then manipulate that through other technologies, which are all, by the way, artificial intelligence is a terrible word because there's nothing artificial about that intelligence. It's an extension of human intelligence, right? So we should be calling it augmented reality or uh, humanized intelligence or whatever we want to call it because in the back of all this is human consciousness, right? Now, the other problem that he doesn't address is that the brain itself is a perceptual experience. How do you know there's a brain? Well, you can see it in the same way that you can see these shoes. So the brain itself is an experience. And the brain is an experience of what? Sensations, images, feelings, thoughts, sense, perceptions. We've already said we cannot explain sense perceptions other than as modifications of consciousness. So, what is reality? Reality is, a, what everyday reality is a species-specific mode of knowing and experience. Furthermore, the species itself, that which we call the human species, insect species, snake species, honeybee species, etc. 
those species themselves as physical body minds are modes of consciousness. They are actually, we should not even say species, we should say species of consciousness. Okay, so the evolution of species, Darwin's evolution of species has to be modified. It's not the evolution of species, it's the evolution of consciousness as modes of experience in sentient beings where their biology is also part of the experience. He said, but yeah, but I can manipulate the brain, okay? Well, if you just remember one principle that we started out, there is only consciousness, everything is awareness, and it's symbolic representations we can call brain, flower, hand, body, sofa. These are symbolic representations of a non-material field of infinite possibilities. Infinite possibilities. And the normal human symbolic, because this is a symbolic expression, of one rivulet, you can say, one stream of consciousness, pure consciousness, that, um, that creates a particular experience and um, all it is, is a symbolic representation of pure consciousness, infinite consciousness, all possibilities. And the possibilities are innumerable, almost infinite, as the number of species are innumerable. That includes plants, because plants are species, right? They're biological species. Includes everything that we call the animal world, the bacterial world. What is reality? It's all of it. It's all of it. And consciousness is modifying itself as those experiences. What is the brain? It's another symbol of human consciousness. Another symbol. The brain is what the mind looks like to a third-party observer. <clears throat> I'll repeat that. The brain <laughs> is what the mind looks like to a third-party observer. So, um, you think of a thought. Let's say, you know, my favorite image, beautiful sunset. You have that image, that's subjective experience, mental. And then there's a neural correlate, that's the objective correlate. But neither the brain nor the mind is consciousness. Mind and brain are complementary aspects of consciousness, which by itself is totally formless. The mind element is also formless. You can't see a thought, you can't see that image, you can't see um, the mind, but you know that you have a mind, right? You're experiencing it. And uh, then you say you also know the body, that there's a body. That's the objective correlate of what the mind is. So the human mind, the human body, are both complementary aspects of what we call human consciousness. So, does this mean that we should not do science? Of course we should do science. Look at all the amazing things that can happen okay, in the future with the scientific method. But we should not forget that the, the methodology itself is um, the activity of the human species, or you might say, the species of consciousness that we call human. Do we have access to these other realms? Well, technology is one way, once we understand how technology maps out experience, because that's what it's doing. Technology is mapping our experience, and experience itself is a symbolic representation, but the technology itself is also a symbolic representation of the real reality. The real reality as Rumi says, this is not the real reality. The real reality is behind the curtain. In truth, we are not here. This is our shadow. This is 
the symbolic representation of our self. So technology is one way that we will expand our range of sensory experience. <clears throat> but then, you know, there's another way. It's a little more, um, requires a little more patience and a deeper understanding, but it's also liberating. Because technology can't liberate you into the freedom of knowing that you're not subject to birth and death, and this is a beautiful, uh, sometimes beautiful, and sometimes, sometimes beautiful dream, and sometimes ugly nightmare, and that um, we, are, we are creating it. We, as pure consciousness, are creating all these um, various dreamscapes. And right now we are in a particular dreamscape where this is the experience. You, me, this, all of that. So technology can expand our understanding and you'll see that these guys are very close. I was going to show you another video but I'll do it some other time. But they're very close into understanding, at least he admits, right? That the world that you see is not the world, it's one version of the world, one model of the world, one little fragment of the dreamscape which has infinite versions, infinite versions. What's the other way? The other way is to slowly deconstruct every experience back to its source. So what's the source? Pure consciousness. And what's pure consciousness? Pure consciousness is prior to any experience. Prior to any experience. So it's already infinite possibilities. Pure consciousness is also infinite perceptual possibilities because we said infinite possibilities, right? Pure consciousness is infinite creativity because pure consciousness interacts with its own self and then it creates a particular version, a particular symbolic representation, a particular model of reality. And that's the creative expression of pure consciousness. So it's infinite possibilities, infinite possible perceptual experiences, infinite um, creativity. We already said synchronistic. Everything is correlated with everything else. So non-local correlation, synchronicity. Pure consciousness is in the realm of unpredictability in the realm of unpredictability because it can modulate itself into anything. You know, when I had my um, so-called famous uh, debate with Richard Dawkins, who's um, angry um, um, evolutionary biologist from Oxford, uh, sounds impressive, he has a British accent, um, <laughs> but when we had this conversation many years ago, um, like, you were there. Uh, Marco, where are you? He's sitting there. You were there, right? Yeah. So he screamed at me at one point. I thought he was going to have a stroke. Um, he, when I mentioned Freeman Dyson to him, you know, Freeman Dyson is one of the... Um, only living um, physicists of Einstein's time. He's 93 or 94. He's a professor at uh, Princeton. He's also originally from England. So I, I, I told um, uh, Dawkins in this conversation, which you can find on the internet if you want, and that Freeman Dyson had said that even atoms are unpredictable in in their behavior, atoms, you know, he said every experiment we do forces an atom to make a choice. And he got very upset. He said, 
Dyson couldn't have said that, and um, he should sue you, and all of that. And nobody understands what you're saying. I asked the audience, do you understand what I'm saying? And most of them raised their hand, and he looked at the audience, said, you're lying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was a fascinating conversation. But I wrote to Freeman Dyson afterwards, and I copied Richard, and I said, you know, according to him, you should sue me because I misquoted you. But I was quoting you from your book, um, um, Infinite in All Directions. And he wrote back, he said, first of all, you know, I'm not going to sue anyone for anything. Um, but there are three riddles that have occupied my attention my entire life. Number one, um, the unpredictable movement of atoms. Unpredictable. It doesn't say random. Yeah. Random means inherently random. Unpredictable means I don't know what's happening because I can't predict it, right? It's like you go to Grand Central Station or Penn Station um, where I'm going to be next week, I'm going to Boston. Uh, you look, everybody seems to be moving unpredictably. But they're all going to a place, right? Somebody's going to Boston, somebody's going to Washington, Penn Station. If you come every day, you could all probably also create a distribution curve of the probability of how many people are going to Boston, how many. And that's how atoms behave. They behave totally unpredictably. Okay? And yet, in the end, this is the result. A universe. So what's a quantum fluctuation? A quantum fluctuation is the temporary, temporary, unpredictable appearance of what is called an energy particle based on uncertainty principles, as allowed by the uncertainty principle. So these, these atoms are bubbling out from an what they call a quantum um, void. They call it the quantum vacuum. That's a model. And um, they're building a universe. So he said one thing is the unpredictable movement of atoms. One riddle that has occupied my attention all my life. The second is a universe that's fine-tuned for mind and life. You know, if any of the mathematical constants were even slightly off, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Okay? There are many of these constants. You know, the ratio of the gravitational field to the electromagnetic field, the size of the proton, the mass of the neutron, on and on and on. They all have to fit. If one of them is missing, no universe. So that's the second riddle that has um, occupied my life. And the third is our own consciousness. He said, I have no answer to these riddles, but I think they're connected. You know, that was his email, beautiful email, and I, I have it uh, someday for future generations to read it. But what we are saying right now is, if you surrender to unpredictability, which is the very basis of creation, what we call unpredictability is the basis of creation. There would be no creativity if there was no unpredictability. Zero. It is unpredictability which allows room for creativity. Right? If a system is totally predictable, where's the creativity? So here's the clue. Unpredictability, infinite possibilities, infinite possible modes of perceptual experience. Everything is inseparable and in synchronicity with everything else. And behind it all is something called intention that is organizing this whole synchronicity. 
So, therefore, if I can go beyond the fluctuations of mind, fluctuate, because mind is fluctuations of consciousness, right? So is feeling, so is perception. All fluctuations, if I can go beyond all this to the source field, even as I say the word source field, it's misleading. Because field conjures up an image of something extending in infinite directions. But consciousness cannot be imagined. It has no form. Right? It has no form. So consciousness is inconceivable. Don't try to imagine it. It is the one that is doing the imagination right this moment. Okay, it's inconceivable, it's unimaginable. The inconceivable makes concepts possible. The unimaginable makes imagination possible. The non-perceptualizable makes perception possible. Ultimate reality cannot be grasped through mind. The mind is actually the interface. Interface. You know what an interface is, right? Your computer has an interface. There's a mouse, there's the keyboard, and there are all these icons, right? And then there's the belly of the computer where all the action is. You can press an icon, Amazon.com, Chopra Center, opens up a world for you. So we, and this is called, by the way, the interface, interface model of perception. It's a, a model created by Don Hoffman, who is a professor of cognitive, uh, uh, cognitive uh, neuroscience at University of California in Irvine. I think in October or November, if you go on the internet, check out uh, Science and Non-Duality. Uh, he and I will be doing a conversation at this conference on stage about the nature of reality. So he's created this model. He says, you and I, as this body-mind, are icons on the desktop computer interface of the cosmic computer, okay? And these icons are interacting with each other in a virtual reality arcade. And um, we mistake the virtual reality arcade for the real reality, which is in the belly of the computer. In this case, the belly of the cosmic computer, which is inconceivable, non-perceptual, unimaginable, but without which there would be no experience. So what I'm saying is, if we can transcend back to the source, and this is what yoga is about. Yoga is, you know, the word yoga means union, union with the source of all reality, and that is pure consciousness. If we can transcend yoga, the word Yoga means yuj. It's the same as the English word yoke. Jesus Christ. My yoke is easy and my burden is light because I'm connected to the source. Not the source field. The inconceivable, formless, ontological primitive of the universe that gives rise to all species of consciousness having their own experience, if I can transcend to that. And that's called samadhi. Samadhi is where the observer, the observed, and the process of observation all merge into being, into, into, uh, into pure potentiality. If I can go there and introduce a faint impulse intention, surrender to uncertainty, and then allow the organizing power of consciousness 
to orchestrate once more the differentiation into knower, knowing, and known, into observer, observing, and that which is observed, into seer, seeing, and scenery, then I could enter these other realms of reality. Okay? And this is what is called, in, in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, these are called Siddhis. Siddhis means supernormal powers. But there are actually dormant potentials that exist in pure consciousness in the field of all possibilities. Okay, practically, therefore, who are you? You are a particular mode of knowing, a knower and something known, all within the infinite range of knowers, modes of knowing, and objects known. So if I can get to there, they can then enter from there all these different realms. To some extent, we do it when we dream at night. You know, things are uncertain, unpredictable. There are images that are coming and going. There's a faint story. So actually the dream world is getting a little closer. And then in deep sleep, we're there. In deep sleep, the knower, knowing, and known all merge into just existence. So when scientists say, you know, if I bang somebody on the head, or anesthesiologists say, if I give them anesthesia, they lose consciousness. What we can say is, or oh, somebody is dead, then they lose consciousness. So we can say is, they lose conscious qualia experience. Because even in anesthesia or deep sleep, your consciousness is regulating all the activities of your body. I mentioned this morning, you know, amyloid is being removed and you know, the brain is cleansing itself. So all these symbolic expressions of consciousness, in fact, are even more active in deep sleep. So deep sleep is taking us back to pure consciousness. It's closer to truth than this experience, which is a lucid dream. What happened a second ago is over. I keep saying that. Because every perceptual experience is over as soon as it arises. Why does it seem like it's continuous? Because we recycle the same qualia from the field of all possibilities. So what is creativity? Creativity is changing meaning, context, relationship with the same qualia, same qualities of experience that we have as human beings. Red and blue and green and you know, sound and taste and smell and all of that. And so when we transcend and incubate there with an intention even better with a question. What would the world of birds be like? Okay? And then maybe we can then tap into that experience. So, anyone last week at uh, Silent Awakenings? Anybody? Yeah, Marco. And so I was mentioning at that... Um, a few years ago at one of these consciousness conferences. If you're interested in these conferences, there are two of them. One is called Science of Consciousness. The other is called um, Science and Non-Duality. 99% of the people there are physicalists. Uh, but there's a few very interesting non-physical uh, consciousness experts there too. So at one of these conferences a long time ago, Almost 10 years ago, there was a woman from Sweden who said to me, um, um, I, can, I, I, I can communicate with birds. This was 15 maybe years ago, and I kind of tried to walk away um, because that didn't fit my physicalist ontology. <laughs> And as I was walking away, she said, by the way, I did my neuroscience at Karolinska Institute in Sweden. I stopped. 
because now, you know, Karolinska Institute is where they give Nobel Prizes and all this. So now suddenly my perception of her shifted, <laughs> right? Because our perception of people is based on our biases and conditioning and prejudice. So I said, really? You communicate with birds? She says, yeah. <laughs> she said, come sit with me. And I sat with her and she said, look, that bird over there, it's going to come and sit on my lap in five minutes. And it did. Okay? And I said, what did you do afterwards, you know? She said, no, I just went um, into pure silence and then I asked it to come, but not in language. I just sensed, communed, felt, and it came. Okay? So when you go to the source, then you can enter these worlds because they're all perceptual modes of the one consciousness, right? This is what the Siddhis are. And Siddhis uh, are when uh, three things come together. Dhyan, which is meditation. Dharna, which is a focused awareness. And Samadhi, which is transcendence. Now you say, how can I have a focused intention if I'm already in Samadhi? And the answer is, actually you can't. It's an it's unmanifest intention that you've carried there before, in a sense. So you're basically dancing at the edge of the unmanifest and the manifest in, uh, when you do Dhyan Dharna Samadhi. In actually Vedanta, there are four levels of that intention. And you don't, we don't need to go into all this, but it's interesting because the levels of intention are called para, pashanti, madhyama, vekri. So para is you have an intention, but you're not even aware of it consciously. Pashanti is it's just at the cusp of the unmanifest and the manifest. Madhyama, it's a thought. And then... Vekari, it's now everything, emotion, perception, all modifications of the same one consciousness. 99.9999999% of the universe is sub-empirical, which means it's not available to measurement. Only 0.001% is empirical. That means you can observe it. But who is observing it? What is observing it? Consciousness is observing itself as that particular mode of knowing, that particular knower, and that object known. Very difficult to describe in words. So a lot of traditions, I mentioned this tradition uh, Tibetan tradition, which is full of qualia-rich experiences. There's a painting, I actually have it in my home, um, by one of those great lamas of the celestial arts, where there's a god, in this case Rahul, and he has eyes in every hair follicle. He has eyes in every grain of his fingernails, in his genitalia, everywhere which is a metaphor for how universal consciousness is looking at itself in infinite ways, in infinite, as infinite knowers, infinite modes of knowing, infinite objects known. Bottom line, learn to observe. Start taking a stand this is a phrase some non-dualists use, start taking a stand which is I am witnessing awareness. I am witnessing awareness. That which I call the mind is an appearance in witnessing awareness. It's both an arising and a subsiding. And it's actually a modified form of the same witnessing awareness. 
that which we call the body, is another appearance in witnessing awareness. And a subsiding. It's an arising, it's a subsiding. And it is a modified form of the same witnessing awareness. And that which we call the world, bottles and microphones and shoes, flowers, these are also an arising and subsiding in witnessing awareness. So, all there is, is awareness witnessing itself in these symbolic expressions. Okay? So, take a stand as witnessing awareness. The only identity you have is witnessing awareness. Because everything else is arising and subsiding, and even when you witness your childhood, when you were a teenager, you see those images, you see your classroom, you as a child, parents, those arising and subsidings have gone, but the witnessing awareness is constant. So the witnessing awareness is the constant in every experience. Being the constant in every experience, it has to be the only reality. So take that as a position. Of course, everything else we're doing, meditation, self-reflection, um, vipassana, all these are very helpful, and it's a process. But once you say, my identity at all times is witnessing awareness, something very interesting will happen. You will start to see the symbols. That's a symbol. That's a symbol. This is a symbol. Thought is a symbol. You will start to see that even the symbols are nothing other than witnessing awareness. They appear to be in time, but no experience actually is in the physical world. The color red does not exist in the physical world. There's no location for the color wet. On the color red or the experience wet. Or any other thing that we call an experience. There's no location for it. It's just... Witnessing awareness appearing in this eternal now as a symbolic expression. To what point? To what point any of this? And the point is freedom. Freedom from the limitations that we have imposed on our reality. Because everything that you call reality is actually a symbolic representation of the conditioned mind. And the conditioning is very deep, okay? It goes back thousands of years. That's why it takes a little struggle to finally get it, that it's all conditioning. Every word that you use, every bit of language, every description, every, every, um, every, um, everything that we can express in words is a symbolic representation of something much more, something much bigger, so big that the only word we can use is infinite. That's why in inconceivable. Okay, Take a stand as witnessing awareness. Everyone understand what that means, right? You are the witness of all experience, including the experience of mind-body, 
and universe. First principle. Second principle, recognize that every experience, every experience, which means every relationship, every encounter, every situation, every object, every experience is a projection of conditioned consciousness. It's not real. It's real when you're experiencing it. So maybe you shouldn't, we shouldn't say it's not real, we should say it's false. It is a impermanent mode of symbolic representation of the true self. So you don't like what's happening to you, you like what's happening to you, the you that is experiencing that is a conditioned consciousness. Therefore, there are no solutions to any problem other than a shift in consciousness. And the best, easiest shift is to move from fear to love. Easiest, for simplicity's sake. Fear separates. Love makes it obvious that all is one. The second principle. Third principle Your true self was never born and is not subject to death. What is born and dies is a symbolic representation of the true self. Whether we call it body, mind, universe, it's all one unified symbolic representation of the species of consciousness that we call human. So your true self is eternal. Now eternal does not mean that it stretches endlessly in time. Eternal means not in time. Not in the realm of time. Fourth principle. Fourth? Fourth, okay. Fourth principle. If you can see it, touch it, taste it, smell it, think about it, imagine it, conceptualize it in any form, then it's not real. <laughs> the only reality is that which cannot be seen, but without which there is no thing. That which cannot be imagined, but without which there is no imagination. That which cannot be conceived, that is totally inconceivable, but without which there is no thought or conception. Your true self is formless being, assuming form as knower, knowing, and known, seer, seeing, a scenery, subject, object, and the interaction between the two. In, um, in Sanskrit, this trinity of experience, seer, seeing, and scenery, is called Rishi, Devata, Chandas. So Rishi is the seer. Devata is seeing, and chandas is that which is seen. Seer is the individual knower. If you want, you can call it jiva or the individual soul. That's rishi. Devata means the process of seeing. By the way, when I'm saying seeing, I'm applying it to all the five modes of perception, and all modes of knowing. So, devata is the process. Devata also means, by the way, divine. So, 
Um, it is the divine that is experiencing. This is, this is the divine that is experiencing this reality. This reality. That's the process. And chandas means the manifestation, the physical, or what we call the physical manifestation. Because it, there's nothing physical about it. It's just a modified form of consciousness as seer, seeing, and scenery. Nor knowing and known. In infinite modes. So, this allows us, this, these, these simple principles allow us to get what in Sanskrit is called moksha. Moksha, moksha which is called freedom. Freedom from karma. Now, karma is a kind of loaded word, but it has kind of become part of everybody's vocabulary. So, karma just means attachment to conditioned, uh, conditioned mind, which has been recycling over and over and over. Historical conditioning, economic conditioning, religious conditioning, theological conditioning, philosophical conditioning, um, scientific conditioning. These are modes of modes of conditioning is a is a system of thought. Right? Conditioning is a system of thought. No system of thought can give you access to reality. Only the source of thought can give you access to reality. Okay, so what do systems of thought do? They create models of reality, including the beautiful model that you saw from David Eagleman. Okay. One little push and he could be right there because already he's questioning what is everyday reality, right? And um, everyday reality cannot be a system of thought. No matter how elegant the model is, the model is not the reality. Now, you know, there was, in the 1940s, there was another great uh, philosopher, thinker, what was his name? Actually, there's, you know, the poems we were reading yesterday, I wrote a poem about him, and he's in, the, in that book. His name is Alfred Gorzybski. <coughs> and he came up with the theory of general semantics. He said, the words we use represent the models of reality we have. Okay, so words are not just descriptions. They create our reality. They create our reality. Which is, you know, again, it's in, it's in many scriptures. First there was the word, and the word was made into flesh. But that's a human reality that we construct through words and through stories. So he came up with this theory of general semantics. One of his, um, he was Polish, he, you know, he was in the early 40s, came to this country, and there was so much going on in the 40s with Nazism and war, etc. Some of these great thinkers, they never actually made a public impact, even of, though he was uh, an amazing thinker. So he's credited with two theories. One is called the theory of general semantics, that words actually create our reality. One of his early demonstrations was he was giving a class in Chicago, I think, and uh, he gave um, um, his students some biscuits. And while they were eating them, he said, actually, they are... Um, they, are, uh, they have poison, and these are dog biscuits to get rid of dogs when, you know, they're dying. Everybody threw up while they were eating, eating the biscuits. So just by the words, he changed their biology immediately and their reality. So words, be very careful. One of the 
one of the eightfold path of true enlightenment of the Buddha. Uh, you know the eightfold, right? Right thinking, uh, right perception, uh, right speech, um, right focus of awareness, um, right livelihood. Um, by right, he means most evolutionary, but um, um, right uh, mindfulness um, and right practice, daily sadhana. These are Buddha's eight full paths. So one of them is right speech. Be very mindful of the way you use words. Uh, before you speak, ask yourself, is it true or do I think it's true? Because truth is such a mysterious thing. Number one, is it necessary? Is it helpful? Is it kind? Is it compassionate? And if it is, is it going to change things? Then speak. Otherwise, there's no point in speaking. And so conscious awareness of speech is very important. The other thing, so that's referring to Korzybsi's work on semantics. The other thing uh, Korzybsi is credited with is something called abstraction. So David Eagleman said, your visual spectrum is taking in one-tenth of a trillionth. You've heard that, saw that, right? But Korzybsi went further. When information hits your eyes in the retina and is converted, photons are converted into electrochemical signals, some of the information is edited out. The chemical reaction in the retina sets an electrical current to the brain, more information is taken out, just by the process of conversion. One mode of information into another mode of information chemical now into electrical. When it hits the brain, um, then another abstraction. Abstraction means abstracted, taken out. Okay, third level. The brain produces a neuropeptide, a chemical signal, fourth level of abstraction. Then the neurochemical hits a re receptor site, fifth level of abstraction. And voila, you see this. And we say this is reality. We don't even know how this happens according to the physicalist model. How those bits of information, the it from the bit, how does it create that? That's the hard problem. It's unsolvable if you use a physicalist ontology. But if you understand this, and the principles I've just mentioned, it starts to loosen the hold of the conditioning. And once you get rid of conditioning, then you have what is called a religious experience. Okay, Religious experience is not religious systems of thought or religious ideologies. But when you look at all the different descriptions of the religious experience, the first is transcendence. What you experience is beyond description because it's the source of every description. It's the source of every thought. It's the source of every image. It's the source of every qualia. That's one. The second is, out of that experience, the deep understanding that all is one. And that then translates into what we call platonic values, like truth, goodness, beauty, harmony, love, compassion, joy, equanimity. These are qualities of experience that comes from the one being. And the third is the loss of the fear of death. Because there's a deep conviction, I doesn't die. What I is experiencing is dying all the time because it's just a modifying, modified qualia of I. So these three are very essential to all religious experience. 
transcendence, truth, goodness, beauty, harmony, love, compassion, joy, equanimity as byproducts of the experience and the loss of the fear of death because that which is not in time cannot be subject to death. Okay, so what happens to us when we die? Nothing. What happens to the space in this room? Let's say there's an earthquake and, and the walls collapse. Nothing, right? So this body-mind is a, is a localization of being. So if I ask you, what did you have for lunch today? What do you have for lunch? Tamale. Okay. Where was that information before I asked her the question? It was in her consciousness, which is without form. But as soon as she said tamale, where did you eat? Poinsettia room. Now you can see the picture, you can imagine the taste. None of that was her experience till I asked her the question. So just to retrieve that thought, she had to go to formless being. Are you understanding? Just to retrieve that thought. Because there's no, nothing in the brain that says tamale. There's no neural networks that says, tamale, poinsettia room. This is what it looks like, okay? She had to, for every thought that we have, we go to formless being. So where do we go when we die? We're there already. Without that, you can't have a thought. Okay? You go to, if you go anywhere, you go to where that tamale was before I asked her the question. <laughs> okay? Formless being gives rise to all experience, including that thought, or what we call memory. But that memory did not exist in her brain till I asked her the question. And then there was the electrochemical correlate of that memory. So when she had the intention, what did I have for lunch? Where was it? Then she had the experience. So too, formless being, being in a state of perfect equilibrium, by necessity, disturbs itself through an intention. And then recycles as the experience of knower, knowing, and known, what we call reincarnation. It's again, you know, worded, loaded word. What reincarnates is tendencies, karmic tendencies for thought, for imagination, for experience, for desire, etc. But once you become aware of the process, then you can orchestrate what we call everyday reality, including the cycle of birth and death. Okay, that was a lot of stuff, huh? Um, yes. Where does thought come from? Thought is consciousness, awareness, modifying itself as that experience that we call thought. It comes from being, from formless being. And usually, it's not yours. It's the recycling of the conditioned mind. Unless you have a creative breakthrough, E is equal to MC squared. Even then, it's not yours. You're tapping into the cosmic mind, okay? Or you come up with Beethoven's Fifth or the most amazing Mona Lisa. Um, that is breaking away from the collective thought. Otherwise, thoughts don't belong to you. That's why you should never take ownership of your thoughts. You don't own something. Don't impose ownership on something that doesn't belong to you. Just say, next. Um, 
Mm-hmm. So suffering, difference between pain and suffering, okay? Pain is a very necessary experience. Why? Because pain, just like is the opposite of pleasure, the perfect state of well-being is homeostasis, independent of both pain and pleasure, just perfect balance, peace that passes understanding. So pain and pleasure are kind of like the banks of a river, and you're kind of the river itself, flowing between these banks. Suffering is a result of misperception of reality. So in in the Vedanta, by the time, what time was I supposed to finish? Now? Okay, so we have time. Okay, so um, suffering in the Vedanta is a misperception of reality. And it's the, the, um, remember, Vedanta is the system of thought. Okay, so Vedanta is not reality either. It's a, another system, maybe closer to reality, but reality can't be a system of thought. So there's Vedanta and then there's non-dual being, which is not a system of thought. In being there's no suffering. Okay, so Vedanta says that um, there are five reasons for suffering, five kleshas they are called, human suffering. The first is not knowing who you really are. You confuse yourself with the experience. You see, the body, most people think they are their body-mind, but the body-mind is an experience, right? Like any other experience. And it's also, as an experience, it's, a, it's an activity. There's no constancy even to the body-mind. Okay, so you don't know who you are. You don't know what true self is, number one. Number two, holding on to that which cannot be held on to, which is any experience. You can't hold on to an experience because it's over by the time you even try to grasp it. It's evanescent. Number three, the fear of impermanence, but impermanence is the fundamental nature of experience. Number four, identifying yourself with your ego or conditioned mind. And number five, the fear of death. And these five causes are connected to the first cause. You don't know yourself as the source of experience. Sure. properly. Okay. So one cause of suffering that is a challenge for me is, as an example, we raise animals for food and we treat them in a way that causes them pain and suffering, emotional anguish, etc. I love to hear about that. And then the other is, let's say there's a child and the child is victimized or harmed in some way. Um, can you also speak to that? Those yeah. just seem to be okay. two good proxies. Those okay. are very good examples. So once we become aware of all this, as you are, then you, as this particular experience, will not not, um, add to that suffering, right? You will not participate in that suffering. You will not eat animals. You will not um, um, eat um, the way... You will not participate in the, the way they are manufactured, literally, industrial food manufacture. So that will at least take you out of that, adding to that stream of suffering, right? If enough people get that awareness, then that will change as well. However, do recognize that um, life as we know it, of sentient beings, is an ecosystem where there's a predator-prey relationship. Okay. I gave you that example of the tree yesterday, that there's so many versions of the tree. Now, Don Hoffman, my friend, the cognitive scientist, he says 
the evolutionary process hides truth from us. Why? Because you have access to your umwelt. Other species have access to their umwelt. And we are participating as species of consciousness where every species is transforming into the other species because the one consciousness is consuming itself. There's only the one consciousness. So, from a point of view of eliminating suffering, you say it's all consciousness anyway, whether it's a plant or a tree or a fruit or an animal or whatever. So, in the terms of absolute truth, all you're doing is you're recycling consciousness into different species. If you had access to all of this, you would probably not survive. As a, if you knew all this at the level of experience, you wouldn't eat anything, right? You wouldn't even eat a plant because it's a sentient being. So, in a way, our sensory experience hides the truth from us so we can keep evolving and expanding our consciousness. Having said that, the more your consciousness exp uh, expands, the more you automatically practice ahimsa, which is non-violence. And if enough people do it, then the world changes. Sure, sure. Um, last time you mentioned sacred activism, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you could unpack that a little bit more because it's something that I've been thinking about. Sacred activism. Yeah. It's summarized in the words of Mahatma Gandhi be the change you want to see in the world. You want to see peace in the world, be peaceful. You want to see love in the world, become love yourself. So, um, the three components of that sacred activism. And there are Hindi words, Punjabi words, Sanskrit words. Seva, which means service. Satsang, which is Sangha. This is a Sangha, gathering together. So we are all interested in the same thing. And Simran, which is spiritual practice. The, the, those three would be sacred activism. And now it's kind of more easy because social media, networks, etc., you know, we are kind of extending our range of ability to spread these ideas. Uh, <laughs> Going to a protest in peace and love is, um, is giving a little intention to that. But very frequently that does turn into strident, you're yeah, carrying a sound, shouting, becomes a riot of peaceful people. So, uh, <laughs> no, you know, what we did last night was a bit sacred activism because we were addressing these issues, right? We can do this also through cyberspace now, through social networks. Our app, Jio, if you're familiar, that's, that's the same thing, Jio. Tomorrow you'll get a demonstration by Punacha on how the technology can measure the energy in a room and actually measure, in a way, collective consciousness. So I think um, that will soon be a movement. But it will not be a movement of of uh, hypocrisy. Many years ago, I had um, Andrew, Andrew, not, what's his name, Andrew? No. Huh? Andrew Harvey. So he's an uh, English, Oxford, Don, at the age of 23, he was three PhDs, etc. He's uh, very flamboyantly gay, and he's uh, 
a big name in the spiritual movements in the world. And at that time, he was living in Las Vegas. And I said, Andrew, how come you live in Las Vegas and do all this spiritual work? He said, it's the most spiritual city in the world, in his British accent. Uh, I said, most spiritual, yes. He says, because it, it's not, uh, it's not um, pretending to be what it's not, which is what everybody is doing, you know? And I thought that was very honest. How do we transcend? Physical pain. Physical pain. Well, on a medical level, first you look at the root cause of pain, address that. And transcendence, actually, when you transcend, there is no experience of pain when you transcend. And even when you bring awareness to the brain, you know, when you, what's Rumi's quote, the, the cure of pain is in the pain. So you don't avoid pain, you don't take your attention away from it, you in fact bring awareness to it. But awareness is not the same thing as thought, right? Awareness is just be with it. And the more you're with it, then awareness is self-regulating. And the more practice you have of bringing awareness, transcending, and looking at the root causes, I would say one of the best ways is also to um, to reset your biological rhythms, contact with the earth. Okay, see you uh, soon.